Hello class, this is Dr. Branch. I'm going to give you a brief lecture here on some key terms and ideas associated with ethics. We'll just be hitting the tops of some hills, trying to introduce you to some significant terms, and we'll also be discussing why we should study Christian ethics in particular. So the first thing I want to point out to you is that ethics is really one of the four divisions of philosophy. This is not really brought out in either the Feinberg's or in Geisler's introductory, introductory book to ethics. So I simply point out to you here that ethics is the fourth division of philosophy, often called axiology, because it deals with values and how we, we view things. Axiology actually contains more than ethics. It also includes the idea of beauty and how you would understand things such as art and place a value on those things. So I'm going to scoot through these different discussions of the major divisions of philosophy. I'm only putting this here to alert you to the fact that ethics is the fourth division of philosophy. And make sure that you understand that. So I'm going to scoot past some of those things. Here's my comment on blogging. I love this discussion between the two dogs. I had my own blog for a while, but I decided to go back to just pointless, incessant barking. Well, that's how I feel about a lot of blogs. If you'll remember on the syllabus, it says you are not to use someone's blog as a source on one of our papers. So let me give you some significant terms associated with ethics and Christian ethics. First is prima facie duty. Prima facie is a Latin phrase which means first face or first sight. It's an objectively true, exceptionless moral duty. It's usually self-evident in nature, and this is where the first face comes in. It's self-evident. You just glance at it and you say, oh my goodness, that's right or that's wrong. For example, I would say that we have a prima facie duty not to torture babies for fun. And you say, well, that's right. No one wants to torture babies for fun. That's wrong. And it's a prima facie duty. That means it's true until proven otherwise. It, it is true unless it can be overridden or proven to be false. For example, I have a prima facie duty to provide food for my children. I have a prima facie duty to do a good job for my employee if they're paying me a salary. So these are the sort of things that at first glance, without even reflection really, you just say, oh, that's right, or oh, that's wrong. For example, if I said that uh, torturing babies for fun is wrong, you would say, well, prima facie, that's right, just at first glance, absolutely, that's, that's just simply wrong. So this is a term that pops up from time to time that isn't really well defined in the textbook you might be using in my undergraduate or graduate section. Let's talk about rights for just a bit. We live in a day and age when rights are discussed frequently. Rights refer to that which is due to individuals based on core ethical principles. So there are negative rights, and negative rights carry the idea of the rights of non-interference. You have the right, as a general rule, not to be interfered with your speech or with your conscience or with those with whom you associate. But there are also positive rights. Uh, these are rights, th and this is where most of the debate comes in, in modern public policy debate about ethics and rights. What rights are, do we deserve? Do we deserve a right? Do we have a right to free health care? Do we have a right to education? Uh, these are rights typically grounded in the principle of justice. In other words, you have an entitlement to expect other people usually the, the government to do things for you when you're talking about positive rights. So in modern debates, positive rights have to do with what the government's going to do for you usually, and negative rights refer to those areas where are we, the government is not going to interfere with you. So this is uh, some of the debates we have between libertarians, conservatives, liberals revolve around the debate between not negative and positive rights. Some of the debates about surrounding uh, Christian uh, bakers and Christian florists who are being persecuted right now. I'm recording this in 2015 here in the United States for, for their polite refusal not to participate in a homosexual wedding, which they find morally offensive. They are claiming these bakers and florists, these Christian bakers and florists, are claiming they have a negative right 
not to be forced to participate in this. On the other hand, the homosexual activists are claiming they have a positive right to have this service provided to them regardless of someone's personal, uh, personal religious convictions. So positive rights are being used as a wedge to destroy religious freedom is what's happening. And the court is, courts are basically siding with the homosexual activists and saying their positive rights over uh, are super, in, uh, what's the right word for which I'm searching, their positive rights have a higher demand than the Christian's negative rights. So that's why the court's ruling in favor of these um, same-sex couples which want to force Christians to participate in their activity. Paternalism. Paternalism is the moral stance that a person's liberty is justifiably restricted to prevent self-harm or to promote that person's well-being. Uh, paternalism is an inherent liberty-limiting principle. Let's go back to these rights. You have a negative right not to be interfered with. So when it comes to paternalism, traditionally our nation has taken a paternalistic stance towards marijuana and said marijuana destroys brain cells. It's a gateway drug to other drugs. Therefore, we're going to limit your access to marijuana, even though you claim to have a negative right not to be interfered with your smoking of dope. Well, paternalism says we, we care about you, so we're going to make a decision for you. So this is why some libertarians who, who have a pretty uh, conservative view of government regarding fiscal policies actually favor the legalization of marijuana in some cases because they see it as an intrusive paternalism. So this is a term that comes up a lot in ethical debates. When are we being paternalistic? When is it legitimate to be paternalistic? And when is it not right to be paternalistic? For example, I am a parent to my children. I, my, uh, one of my daughters got a speeding ticket several years ago and I told her, if you get another speeding ticket, I'm taking the car away from you. So uh, she got another speeding ticket, and the car got taken away from her for a good long time. While I was being paternalistic, she was insisting that one of her rights was being denied. And I said, yes, it is. It's being denied because you uh, you've got to learn to slow down. So the principal, of course, people who knew me in high school, if you happen to be watching this video, would laugh at the fact that I'm uh, criticizing my children for speeding. But I move on. The principle of double effect holds that there is a morally relevant difference between intending evil and foreseeing it, that it will occur as an unintended side effect of morally permissible acts. The principle of double effect comes into play particularly in medical ethics and bioethics, especially as it relates to many end-of-life decisions. And the principle of double effect says something like this. Let's say that someone is suffering from a terminal disease. You, you choose the type of disease that it is, and they've reached the final stages, and you're working on a good palliative care plan to make them as comfortable as possible within the final weeks and days of their life. It may be the fact that advanced pain treatment would mean that the person would live for three or four weeks as opposed to five or six or seven or eight weeks if the advanced train pain treatment didn't take place. Well, the principle of double effect says your goal is not to shorten their life. Your goal is to provide them good palliative care. Therefore, you're not trying to shorten their life. Well, the principle of double effect says to do the right thing and give this person good palliative care produces the unintended consequence of shorting, shortening their life. But you've not done anything wrong by providing them good palliative care. So this comes up a lot in debates about end-of-life issues. We'll talk about it more, or you'll see it more when we get to the section on euthanasia. And just so you'll know, I affirm the Baptist faith and message statement on the sanctity of life, which says we affirm the sanctity of human life from conception to natural death. So ethics and morality contrasted, they're typically used as synonyms and they're used interchangeably, but actually Morality has more to do with the actual practice of right conduct, whereas ethics goes beyond rules and standards, and we're talking about the entire belief system. Ethics deals not just with the what's, what do we do, but the why, why is this the right decision. Permissible, obligatory, and morally superagoratory. These are three different categories of particular actions. Morally permissible acts are acts that are neither mandated or prohibited. For example, it is permissible to run 
or jog four days a week for good health. You're not mandated to do that, but it is morally permissible. Morally obligatory acts are acts that are either mandated or prohibited. For example, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder. That is a morally obligatory act. We are morally obliged not to murder an innocent human being. Thou shalt not steal. We are morally obliged, it is obligatory upon us, not to take our neighbor's property. Then finally, morally superagoratory acts. These are acts that go beyond the call of duty. They are praiseworthy, but they cannot be mandated. For example, it is praiseworthy if someone donates a kidney to someone who is who is suffering and needs a new kidney, but it's not necessarily mandated. It's supergoratory act. A more common example might be the soldier who throws himself on a grenade to save his fellow soldiers or a marine or sailor, whatever the case may be. Well, that's a noble act and it's honored, but it's not mandated that someone do that. Autonomy, autonomy is the driving term in much of modern ethics. It comes from two words which mean self-law, and so autonomy basically means self-law. Uh, the best example of this in the Bible is Judges 17 and 21, this phrase which brackets the last five chapters of Judges. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's a, that's a statement of autonomy. There's different forms of moral autonomy, but the type of autonomy that's most commonly used in our culture in moral, moral reflection is radical moral autonomy, which is moral decision making based on an anthropocentric basis, based on a human self-centered basis, as opposed to a theocentric ethics based on what God says. The type of moral autonomy I have in mind is clearly described in Romans 1 verses 18 through 32. Well, what about Christian ethics? Christian ethics is the study of right and wrong in which the God of the Bible is taken as the ultimate source of moral authority. Another way of saying that is the study of which actions and attitudes receive God's blessings, which do not receive God's blessings, together with the reason of why. Someone else has defined it this way. It is the study of the kind of conduct, character, and goals demanded of one who wishes to live in a manner consistent with the will, character, and purpose of God. And someone just said it this way, it's an attempt to think and act Christianly. There are different categories. Philosophical ethics or Christian meta-ethics deals with the presuppositions we start with. Uh, what, what presuppositions undergird a particular subject? Then biblical ethics deals what does the biblical text have to say on the subject. In fact, biblical ethics will ask questions like this. What are the ethics of the Pentateuch as opposed to the ethics of the Sermon on the Mount? What are the ethics of the Pauline of epistles as opposed to the ethics we might see in the Catholic epistles of James or First and Second Peter or something like that? Theological ethics... What does the biblical text mean where it addresses the subject? So we might take theological ethics and apply them to things such as abortion, the sanctity of life, end of life issues. Historical Christian ethics. What have other Christians thought about the subject? What are the ethics of Calvin? What are the ethics of Luther? But then applied or practical ethics. How should Christians deal with pressing problems of our day? And this is the focus of my class. What, what is our stance on abortion? What is our stance on euthanasia? What is our stance on divorce? What is our stance on premarital cohabitation? What is our stance on same-sex marriage? So these are applied ethics, and my focus is here as opposed to meta-ethics, and that's the, the basic slant of your textbooks that you're using in this class. The shape of Christian ethics is triangular. This is found in both the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. The Ten Commandments, the first four deal with our relationship with God, and the last six deal with our relationship with other people, and really the tenth going down into our own very heart, the issue of coveting. So the triangular, this uh, relationship between us and God and then us and other people, this is reflected in the great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and your mind. That's vertical. This is the greatest and 
most important commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself, which I believe is the summary of the second table of the law, the second half of the Ten Commandments. That's horizontal. So all the law and prophets depend on these two commandments. So there is a triangular shape to Christian ethics. Where can we go wrong in Christian ethics? There's two ways that we can get perverted in Christian ethics. One is legalism. I grew up in a, a very legalistic church that was focused on rules and do's and don'ts, and they've moved beyond a lot of that now. But things like women don't ever wear pants to church or uh, men don't ever wear facial hair and things like this. And legalism, the primary focus is misplaced on human effort and application of rules rather on, than on God as the source of moral authority and love for God as the motive for moral accountability. Legalism, sometimes called Phariseeism because of the Pharisees' emphasis on rules, and legalism kills. You can read the book of Colossians and it talks about the degree to which legalism is ineffective to change our character. The other side of the problem for Christians, the flip side of the coin, would be antinomianism. The primary focus is misplaced on self and freedom from rules. We might call this liberalism. Our obligation to please God is all but ignored. Paul addressed this error when he said, You are called to freedom, brothers, but don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. Romans 6, 1, he also said, Shall we continue in sin that grace should abound? God forbid. So this is liberalism. And... Um, among Baptists, and more particularly perhaps Southern Baptists, the notion of the priesthood of believer has been misapplied to justify a form of antinomianism or liberalism. I would say that the phrase priesthood of the believer is actually incorrect. To be precise, it is the priesthood of the believers, plural. We are accountable to each other. The, the idea of the priesthood of the believers does not give us a right to pick and choose from the Bible what we like and what we don't like. And it has been used in the past to justify uh, many, many ideas uh, that are contrary to the Bible. Uh, I like what Leon Morris says. He said, Believers are not brought by Christ into a liberty of selfish ease. Rather, since they have been bought by God at terrible cost, they have become God's slaves to do His will. That is from his apostolic preaching of the cross. So why should we, uh, so let me just say, I've already talked about this danger of the priesthood of the believers being abused. So why should we study Christian ethics? Well, first, Jesus said we're to go into the entire world, Judea, Samaria, the end of the earth. That's Acts 1.8. And I know many of you have taken up the Acts 1.8 challenge and you, you have gone to the ends of the earth. If you're going to go to the ends of the earth and when you get there to make disciples, what are you going to teach them about ethics? For example, Sub-Saharan Africa. There are millions of AIDS orphans in Sub-Saharan Africa. These are the children that are being drawn into these uh, warlords armies, these child warriors at 12 year old. They, they put an AK-47 in their hand. And much of the AIDS epidemic has spread in Africa because of bad sexual ethics, the, a very low view of monogamy within marriage and faithfulness to one marriage, one's marriage vows. Even some men had the very distorted and twisted idea that if they sleep with a virgin, then somehow that will cure them of AIDS. And this has fueled the spread of AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa. My point is, if you're concerned about blood diamonds and children in these warlords armies and, and these AIDS orphans in Sub-Saharan Africa, and, and I know many of you are, then that implies that when you get there, you've got to teach Christian ethics and teach them that Christians are, are faithful to their marriage vows and we don't sleep around on each other. This is all part of Christian ethics. The Great Commission, Jesus said that we're to teach them to observe all things commanded by Jesus Christ. Well, that implies ethics. So it helps us answer two crucial questions. What does it mean to follow Jesus as Lord? And what are the marks of Christian maturity? If you're going to fulfill the Great Commission, that means you have to teach great Christian ethics. Apologetics. Our non-Christian friends and our enemies are very curious about why, and, uh, why we oppose abortion and gay marriage. My, my wife and I have known many non-Christian people and in the last 10 to 15 years. When we start talking to them about Jesus, their first question is not about the resurrection 
It's not about the cross or why we believe the Gospels. Their first question is usually, why do you guys hate gay people? Well, you know that we don't hate homosexual people, but from secular people's mindset, they've been, um, they've been convinced by whatever they've seen on the evening news or Will and Grace or, or Friends or whatever TV program that Christians are anti-homosexual, and that's their first question. So we have to give a reasoned response. So part of giving a, a Christian response is an ethical response, actually. Why do we believe that sex is reserved for heterosexual monogamous marriage? And so we try to give an apologetic for that. Evangelism and repentance. A, a healthy gospel presentation is going to include repentance in that presentation. So when we call people to repent of their sin, from what are we asking them to turn? And Christian ethics has a lot to say there. Sanctification. Christian ethics helps answer this question. What does it mean to be holy? I like what John Owen, the Puritan author, said. And I'm going to quote him. Here's what he said. Gospel truth is the only root from which gospel holiness grows. If the root is corrupt, the fruit will be corrupt also. It is impossible to maintain the power of godliness where the doctrine from which it comes is unknown, corrupted, or despised. On the other hand, where men are tired of holiness, they will not long continue faithful to divine truth. He means they won't stay as Christians. The great opposition made to every gospel doctrine today is because men dislike holiness. I can't stress that enough. I completely agree with what Owen said there. And in fact, what I have found is the most common objection to, to the gospel, again, is not the resurrection of the cross or why the synoptics differ from John. No, the most common objection is Jesus cramps my sin habit. If Jesus is Lord, then what I'm doing is wrong. And the Christian doctrine of sanctification is an offense to lost people. It's a major objection to the gospel. Then teaching the whole counsel of God. Paul told the leaders at the church of Ephesus, the, the elders there, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. If you're going to preach the entire Bible, then that means you're going to have to touch on ethical issues that are uh, somewhat difficult at times. And then finally, I want to say that I am a Southern Baptist, and we want to give a Southern Baptist response to different ethical issues. This is a quote from James Pettigrew Boyce to uh, John Broadus. He was writing a letter to John Broadus trying to encourage Broadus to join him on that original faculty of Southern Seminary in the late 1850s. And, and he said this to Broadus, and I like this very much. He said, What do we need now among Baptists? A number of educated men to aid in forming the public sentiment of the churches. That is a goal of this class for me. I want to aid in forming the public sentiment of the churches. I hope you're going to come out of this class with information that's going to help you go to Southern Baptist churches and teach them why we believe in the sanctity of life, why we believe in the sanctity of marriage, why we believe in sexual purity, why we believe that divorce is a bad idea. We'll, we'll talk about all the, the complexities of divorce when we get there, but why basically it's a bad idea. Why we want to explain to them that holiness is a good thing. I want the students from my class to go out and form the public sentiment of Southern Baptist churches. Well, that's the end of this lecture. I hope it's been of help to you, and uh, I hope these ideas will prepare you for what we're studying later on this semester.